Hello, everyone. Hi, Ashley and Susan. Hi, everybody. Good to be here. Great to have you with us. Lovely to see so many faces from around the globe. Yeah. I guess Lisa, we can see style. You are more than welcome to have your camera on if you would like, um, just to see each other. And if you can um, rename yourself with your name, your member center, and your country. Colleagues online like to see how we are spanning the globe in these conversations. So it helps us to orient ourselves by name, the abbreviation of your member center and where you're based, the country. So you're welcome to do that. Look at all those great faces. Excellent, we'll just give one more minute, yeah. I will just also remind uh, everyone that we, as always, we have the interpretation button. So make sure you're on your channel and for the speakers to speak, not uh, yeah, to speak slow <laughs> and be solidarity with the interpreters today. Yeah. So, so uh, um, better quickly, just, yeah, we just mentioned that. So uh, for, for the main language, we just need to go to English. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. If you right, so if you if you stay there in the English channel, then you'll get okay. the interpretation. Yeah. Excellent. But why don't we then kick off? Um, Berta, as... I'm sorry. Let me just say one thing, Bert. I'm sorry to bother you again. He just called me again and tried to sign in again, and he still couldn't do it. And he keeps saying, he keeps saying, you have been removed from the list. Yeah, 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 because he was rejected from the list. Yeah, then, but he uh, tried again and it still doesn't no, work. So I told him he, to register again and see if that works. Yeah, yeah. Andrea, or, or, there was, or there was someone else who sent him another different link. I suggest we take this conversation bilaterally. Uh, Berta will be able to support via email and private chat. Okay. And in the meantime, Lisa can start uh, okay. in the interest of, of the time. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome all of you to IRCT facilitated webinar driven by our membership on the subject of survivor engagement. As you will know, and you're seeing it across the globe, survivors in many different ways and shape and forms are those who are the backbone of many of the movements of today. And for IRCT, the survivor engagement is one of the principal and most important aspects of our work. The evidence and the experience that survivors bring to our work, having been through torture, is invaluable. It's absolutely intrinsic to both informing the healing journey of torture survivors, but also informing the journey to justice. It helps us to understand better ways of treatments, better ways of advocating on behalf of torture survivors, and better ways of informing the decisions that our organizations make, so organizational development. With these words, I'm going to hand over to Carmen Arulla, who is the focal point of our survivor engagement strategic work at IRCT, driven, carried out, and implemented by our members. So thank you very much for being here today at this incredibly important event, and over to you, Carmen. Thank you, Lisa. So my name is Carmen Araujo, and I'm indeed the focal point for the survivor engagement project. Survivor engagement is about survivors of torture becoming agents of change in the fight against torture. And survivor engagement is also interlinked with the RCT Global Standards for Rehabilitation 8 and 9, which you can read more of on our website. We have a very diverse and full program ahead of us today with panelists from TAS, the US, Tree of Life, Zimbabwe, ASAF, Israel, KRCT, Kosovo, and Freedom from Torture, the UK. 
we would like to thank um, all the panelists and the audience for participating today. And we would like to remind you that you can use the chat for comments and queries that will be addressed at the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And now I would love to give the floor to Taz. So uh, good morning, everyone. It's morning here in Washington, DC. Um, Andrea Barron, the Advocacy Program Manager from the Torture, Abolition and Survivor Support Coalition. We are based in Washington, DC. TASC was founded in 1998 by Sister Diana Ortiz, an Ursuline Roman Catholic nun who was brutally tortured by the Guatemalan military. TASC provides clinical and legal services to over 270 torture survivors every year. The advocacy program prepares survivors to educate policymakers and the broader public about torture and other human rights abuses, especially in Africa, and about changes needed in the US asylum policy. The pillar of our program is the powerful survivor voice, and you will hear from one of our survivors today, which can be utilized to influence policy and give survivors confidence in their ability to impact issues that concern them. Over 90% of survivors are from Sub-Saharan Africa, reflecting the large concentration of African immigrants who live in the Washington DC area. At the top of our advocacy agenda are two issues that survivors care about deeply. One is influencing US policy on human rights violations committed by their own governments. And you'll hear Yaakov talk about Eritrea. And two, problems with the government agency that's supposed to interview survivors applying for asylum. And this is called USCIS, the US Citizenship and Immigration Services, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security. Over the last eight Security. years, the advocacy program has trained hundreds of survivors to meet with aides to senators and representatives in the US Congress in person before the pandemic and now on Zoom. Every year on or around June 26, we hold June Survivors Week to commemorate the day designated by the UN as International Day in support of victims of torture. Before the pandemic, more than 80 people, including around 40 survivors, participated in June Survivors Week, visiting over 50 congressional offices. Survivors have testified before the State Department's Bureau of Human Rights, the Tom Lantos Human Rights, Commission in the Congress and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. One survivor even had a long meeting with a UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Eritrea. Over the last year, many survivors, including Jacob, who will follow me, have met with congressional aides about what we call the affirmative asylum crisis. Like over 75% of survivors, they entered the US with visas and then applied for asylum. They are not the migrants that you hear about who cross the southern border from Mexico. We call these people, the ones who did not cross from the border, the forgotten migrants, because the US government has treated them very unfairly. It has forced them to wait five, six, or even seven years for an asylum interview. Often they become depressed because they've been separated years from their families like Jacob, and are justifiably frightened of being deported to the countries where they were tortured. TASC launched a national campaign on the affirmative asylum crisis, partnering with other torture treatment centers in New York City, Northern Virginia, and Los Angeles, some of which are members of IRCT, as well as with individuals from survivors from throughout the country. And we had asylum attorneys to help guide us. We've had some success so far, but we've not accomplished our goal of ensuring that no torture survivor must wait over five years for an asylum interview. We've gotten terrific feedback from TAS survivors, as well as from other IRCT members who have joined our campaign. Through focus groups, individual interviews, and surveys, survivors have spoken of their advocacy experience with a sense of pride. They are enthusiastic about learning more about the democratic process and how they could influence US policy toward their countries. They are want to get involved in survivor engagement. So it's not like we are asking them to do us a favor, they want to do it. So that's an important message that I want to send to people. One survivor wrote, quote, I was amazed that I could visit the office of a congressperson even though I was not a citizen. 
and everyone would listen to my story, treat me with respect, and even take notes in what I said. This would never happen in my country. Congressional aides also appreciated hearing from survivors. The deputy chief of staff for a Democratic congressman from Virginia typifies reactions from aides. And I do need to say that the Republican members also respond very, very well to survivors. Congressional aides appreciated hearing from them. Here is what one of them said, quote, Hearing the searing firsthand testimony of the task survivors was incredibly powerful. It is critical that humanitarian policymaking be informed whenever possible by the stories of victims and survivors so that we in Congress do not lose sight of the people who must remain at the core of our work. Now you will hear from Jacob and Fakada. Fakada just signed in. Two of the most courageous and special men I have ever met. Thank you so much, Andrea. We're looking forward to hear from Jacob, and it's really emotional to to hear your your reaction and how invested you are in this. So, please, I would like to give the floor to Jacob. Hi, everybody. Good morning, as Andrea said. It's morning in Washington, D.C. So my name is Jacob Hagos. I am from Eritrea. Uh, Eritrea is located on East Africa, neighboring Ethiopia, Sudan. So I am from Eritrea. Having said this, let me go to my uh, 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 to what I have to say. Thank you for inviting me to speak today to discuss my role as a torture survivor and an advocate with Task International. Visiting the offices of members of the United States Congress, testifying before the US State Department's Bureau of Human Rights and speaking to uh, college students has allowed me to tell the world about torture and the dictatorship in Eritrea, a small country in the Horn of Africa. The dictatorship, the dictatorship in Eritrea is so terrible that thousands of Eritreans have drowned in the Mediterranean Sea trying to escape. I wanted to become a survivor advocate because here in the United States, I am safe why so many Eritreans are still suffering. I was targeted and tortured by the Eritrean government for many reasons. I was one of the first victims of mandatory draft so-called national service. Some men have been forced to spend their entire lives in the military against their will. Military leaders consider me a troublemaker because I asked questions. My time in the military was even worse because I could not do some of the training because my left leg is paralyzed from polio. I was also persecuted because I supported my cousin, David Isaac, an Eritrean Swedish journalist who has been imprisoned in Eritrea since 2001. He was imprisoned because he had an independent newspaper that said Eritrea should have a constitution to protect people's rights and establish rule of law. I asked where Dawit was and said he should be released. The government didn't like what I said. Also, I had an internet cafe and the government got angry when I refused to spy on my customers. The government thought my customers might be looking at websites like Amnesty International that criticize the human rights abuses in Eritrea. I was imprisoned but managed to escape from Eritrea. I arrived in the United States on April 1st, 2016 and applied for asylum. 
I have three jobs now. I am an educational aide in a high school. I work as an interpreter and also work at a parking garage. I am grateful to task advocacy program because I can tell policy makers and the American people what is going on in Eritrea. It is not in the news every day like Ukraine, but people are arrested for no reason. If they tell the truth about their country, they can be tortured. They cannot ask about their friends and the relatives who have been disappeared, or they will be punished like I was for asking about my cousin, the journalist Dawit Isaac. Task help survivors prepare to testify as events like this one. We decide for ourselves what we want our message to be and to get assistance in writing our testimony. We practice reading our testimony aloud to make sure we feel comfortable. The first two times I spoke in public, it was a little difficult because speaking reminded me of what happened to me in Eritrea and why I am applying for asylum. But by the third time, I felt fine. I feel good that by speaking out because I am doing what I can to stop other Eritreans from suffering the way I did. I encourage other survivors to become advocates too. It is how they can help their fellow brothers and sisters back at home to show that those who are still being persecuted back home have not been forgotten. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Jakob. It is a honor for us to hear what you have to say and to, to have you here. And we're looking to forward to hear more in the Q&A session later on. And now I will give the floor to Fekade, who's here with us. Yeah, good morning. Uh, sorry, I'm late. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity given to me. My name is Fakada Ancho, a torture survivor from Ethiopia. I want to thank the International Rehabilitation Council for torture victims for inviting me to speak now, today. I would like to talk about why becoming a survivor advocate with Task International is so important to me. I was born in Addis Ababa, the capital city of Ethiopia. When I was five years old, I contracted polio, which left me paralyzed for the rest of my life. However, thanks to my family and my society, I received treatment that enabled me to work with some support. And now I was able to go to school and then graduate from Addis Ababa University and uh, uh, went to Asmara University with degrees and got degrees in the field of philosophy and diploma in the field of accounting. However, I was not hired for many jobs, mainly because I, I extremely, uh, because of my disability. Finally, I got a good job in Ethiopian Airlines in Ethiopian Airlines. Uh, however, it was very hard to pass through uh, a different uh, uh, harassment or just some kind of uh, imposition upon me. Uh, this was then I decided to learn about my rights and duties to overcome any challenge that I might face. First, I defended myself, and then I started to defend the rights and the benefits of Ethiopian Airlines employees. And the Ethiopian uh, Airlines employee knew that I can uh, represent and uh, I can be a voice for them. And they elected me in uh, our basic trade union, the workers union, and uh, they elected me for the total of nine years. Uh, with a three-year term. 
Uh, I faced a very serious and life-threatening uh, challenge, especially during my last uh, three term. Uh, three term. This is when the Ethiopian government demanded that everyone in the company, especially people in the high positions like myself, uh, promote the government agenda. This party, uh, especially the TPLF party, demanded that total obedience from everyone in the society, particularly in the major economic sectors, such as uh, Ethiopian Airlines. But we, as a union leaders, refused to accept their agenda. High officials started to attack us immediately. This was when I faced serious mental and physical torture and had to resign my job. I became totally desperate and hopeless and my wife and I decided we had to leave, we had to leave uh, our country. We arrived in the United States in September 2016 and applied for asylum in November. Extremely difficult waiting six years for asylum office to interview for me. But during this time, I have become a public advocate with tax. This has given me a great satisfaction. I hope my speech have made a we can give a minute to Fakare, who might have received a phone call just to see what's finishing. Can you hear us, Fakare? If he can't finish, I can finish reading. I guess I'll just finish reading what he had to say. I don't know what happened. Um, okay, so he said that um, it has been extremely difficult for me waiting six years for an asylum office to interview me. But during this time, I have become a public advocate with TASC, which has given me great satisfaction. I hope my speeches have made a difference in ending the terrible human rights abuses and torture in Ethiopia. TASC gave me and so many other torture survivors the opportunity to express our internal feelings. When I first came to America, TASC helped me become stable and to advocate for others just like I did when I was a union leader. For myself and other survivors who have been politically active, our personality fits this kind of advocacy. I was able to meet with aides to senators and representatives in the United States Congress and the State Department. I talk about what happened to me in Ethiopia and how ethnic politics has made our country very dangerous for so many people. I was happy that the Congress really listened to what I had to say. Speaking out at these meetings helped decrease my depression and relieve my trauma. My voice has become more powerful and I feel stronger because of my advocacy. I hope other torture survivors realize they also have a powerful voice and they can be part of the struggle to end torture everywhere and create a better world. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to say Andre and, and Fikari, but I think Fikari is not with us at the moment. Hopefully he can join during the Q&A later on. So thank you so much, Andrea, for, for this teamwork. We know how closely you work. And again, it's just very inspiring to hear all the challenges that he has overcome. So with this, I would like to give the floor to Tree of Life, who are here with us today. And we have two speakers. And I believe Mr. Marimbe Donald is going first. I'm not sure if um, he can hi hear everyone. us. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, my name is Donald Marimbe. I'm using my uh, device um, to reduce the burden on the internet here at the office. That's very fine. Uh, uh, okay. So um, uh, I will be presenting on the True of Life Survivor and Get the Mudo. Uh, and Mike Mure here with me who also present um, on the impact of the approach. Um, so before I go straight to the presentation, I would like to maybe highlight um, that show of life is a 
government organization you did. Mike, if, um, Donald, if you can hear us, there are some sound issues. Your image and sound is frozen. Maybe we can give them a few seconds and a bit of time to maybe switch devices. So I ask for your patience. As you know, we're joining for many different parts of the of the world and many different offices and houses and our internet connection can can vary. Oh, we can see you now. You've now officially defrosted. So you have unmuted yourself. I can see. Do you want to try and and speak now? I think. Yeah. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We've got you back. So okay. the floor is I yours. think it's, it's it's the challenge with the network. So I'll try to reduce in terms of the video. Mm -hmm. If that That's is fine. okay with you, all of you. Thank yeah. you so much. Please go okay. ahead. All right. So um, as I've mentioned, that True of Life is a non-partisan organization uh, that works with um, with rural communities across Zimbabwe. Uh, providing community-based mental health um, and psychosocial support approaches that help uh, people to, living with trauma to reconnect with self, nature, family, and community. Uh, True of Life was founded in 2003 by survivors of trauma. Um, um, and then the model, uh, the survivor engagement model was uh, really behind the notion that um, there were different and various episodes of traumatic uh, experiences that were occurring in Zimbabwe, and True of Life was born in, in, in that wave. It's the model to include survivors in the service delivery and um, uh, service delivery of uh, its interventions into the communities. Um, I'll, I'll just go straight to um, the survivor engagement model. Why we we really focused on survivors to be pioneers and ambassadors of our interventions. So for, for starters, uh, our, our interventions looks at the survivor is community-led and community-centered. So what do we mean? We, we realize that uh, the life of a survivor must go on for so his life after torture. So the life of the, of the survivor must go on despite the traumatic experience that we have faced. Uh, True of Life involves survivors of torture in the program design and implementation. So one of the key uh, processes where survivors have participated is in the, uh, at the highest level of this, making a True of Life, where they have inputted in the strategic planning process uh, that has shaped even a new strategy that is starting from 2023 to 2027, uh, to 2027. Um, True of Life workshops, are uh, organized, facilitated, and um, uh, usually followed up by survivors in the communities. Um, each particular community uh, have a couple of uh, trained community facilitators who are actually survivors. So they are able to roll out activities in their own space, time, and economy. Um, what we have realized is that uh, survivors um, survivors' lives must go on beyond the traumatic experiences. And what we have realized also is that uh, in most instances, we, we cannot uh, speak on behalf of survivors. So what we, we then uh, decided to do was to provide mentorship and supervision to survivors in the community. So before they can facilitate and organize true of life activities, they go through an, a rigorous and extensive uh, two-year skills capacity mentorship program where they can they are taught in terms of facilitation skills, capacity development, so that they are able to support each other in the community. And then um, we also, uh, before an activity is conducted, we conduct what we call pre-assessment, uh, which is actually conducted by survivors. So before we give we refer or we support uh, survivors as true of life. We have uh, community volunteers at the community who are actually survivors, who are actually screening and seeing 
where the survivors require trauma healing or they require uh, individual counseling or further referral pathways. And then um, in terms of uh, capacity building, True of Life also provides training and continuous capacity building to survivors. Um, like what I have earlier on mentioned that survivors are first trained before they, are, they support others. Uh, that capacity building is ongoing for both the staff at True of Life and also the community volunteers. Um, I, I would also like to mention that survivors have, do have a choice to either uh, stop uh, participating or facilitating in you know, providing support in local communities when they feel that it's no longer good for them or safe. So they have the choice to continue or to stop. So it's not like it's a prescriptive or they are forced to really implement. They, they do have a choice to, to, actually to choose what they really do and. And then at the local community level, once Tree of Life um, implement a, a workshop, or maybe a group therapy workshop, they, we, we realized that uh, what we call community facilitators usually encounter uh, vicarious trauma and burnout as a result of um, uh, hearing the group stories that are coming from the, from the survivors. So we provide activity-based debriefing sessions, uh, weekly and monthly debriefing sessions as well, and also self-care platforms that are there to uh, prepare and uh, help uh, caregivers who are actually providing that service. And um, the other thing is we also look at um, uh, periodic case conferences where we discuss different uh, cases, uh, stories, as case studies to prepare our community facilitators so that when they face similar cases in, in the field, they are able to relate cope and better respond or support uh, others. Um, and also uh, bearing in mind that Tree of Life as an organization was uh, founded by survivors. Um, those survivors uh, became, um, uh, if grown in, into uh, what we call elders, uh, the founding survivors are now informing uh, programming in an advisory role and they are considered uh, by true of life is, is the elders. Um, they are there to just provide uh, the, the, the basic uh, support and to ensure that uh, the, 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 the rehabilitation principles are maintained. So I will, in this point in time, I will leave time from, uh, no, before I leave uh, time for Mike, uh, usually when we, we, we roll out our activities into the communities, we, we abide by the IRCT global rehabilitation standards. Uh, we subscribe to them. So we ensure that all the principles are embedded into our work. And um, one of the things that we also focus on is the safety and protection of survivors, uh, which is at the center of our work um, using contextually and culturally appropriate uh, methods. Um, and then also our services are, are uh, provided to everyone. So it means that they are non-discriminatory. We do not select survivors. We treat survivors equally. Um, and then we also subscribe to the notion of do no harm to ensure that survivors, whether they are uh, supported or not supported, they are not uh, exposed to abuse and exploitation, uh, both in the field and in the workplace. And then uh, one of our core principle is really consent and confidentiality. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, issues related to trauma require trust, uh, require uh, survivors, uh, survivors require like a guarantee in terms of whether their stories will be shared also or publicly. So True of Life um, in its work, both at staff level and uh, board level and community level, all maintain confidentiality and our data gathering methods uh, also subscribes to that. Uh, all information is, uh, is safeguarded to ensure the protection of the survivor. And then um, lastly, what I wanted to mention is our interventions are mainly for the survivor um, who resides, who does not reside in isolation. They have a family, they also live in a, in a particular community. So our interventions at the end of the day looks at safeguarding the welfare of the survivor 
and ensure that the survivor re-engages and reconnects with the with the entire community such that they can peacefully coexist um, and also work together towards the development of the community. So at this point in time, I will leave uh, Mike to continue and look at the impacts of the survivor engagement approach. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donald. Uh, I would love to, to comment on it, but in the interest of time, I will now pass the, the floor to Mike. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Mwe. I'm the program. Uh, I will share my reflections uh, as a survivor and working uh, with the true of life. The impact of survivor engagement is individual transformation. Let me, yeah. Okay. Let uh, individual transformation and growth. Uh, because of the intervention is an engage and reconnect with self and community. So after, ex after, after experiencing trauma and you, you go through the intervention, you start feeling, you're feeling the pain, the anger, the revenge, that you have uh, carried, you start feeling subsiding and then you start the healing journey. That's how I felt when I, uh, I participated in the trauma healing and empowerment workshop uh, and intervention by True of Life. And then the feeling, I felt like freed from the bondage of pain and started feeling like the need to help others because I didn't want, I felt like, no other people should go through what I am going through or what I have gone through. Then feeling like uh, wanting to give back to the community to help others in the same situation, like I've just said, so that uh, the pain, the anger, the revenge does not continue. And uh, in the process, uh, helping or supporting uh, in the efforts to break the cycles of violence using other alternative methods to violence, the non-violent uh, ways of dealing with issues. And as a survivor, I felt like uh, I was in a position where I could support others. It was in a way because I've expressed this, uh, I can relate, I could relate to people who were in my situation not that I'm an expert, but the connection at that level uh, was very easy for me. And I continued with that and giving support to my two other colleagues in my community. And with that work in the community, uh, so some community members or some other survivors who, who, whom I was interacting with uh, saw me as a source of inspiration and not really a model, I wouldn't say a model, but a source of inspiration. And because they, they were also going through a lot of pain and they feeling like, okay, knowing that Mike also went through this and they can work their way towards healing as well. And me doing that work, I felt like the compassionate resilience, seeing people that are, I am helping uh, standing up to start doing work, to re-engage, start developing themselves and uh, working towards uh, a peaceful community, stopping the cycle of violence. So that was helpful and it's helpful when we work with the uh, survivors of engagement, the survivors uh, of trauma, because they can help in that process from a, an expert or from an informed position because they've gone through the they've gone through the, the same journey as well. And <clears throat> uh, I felt I could uh, live a life, a life out of trauma and then start developing myself and other uh, 
survivors that have interacted with and encouraging each other that there's life after trauma, like my colleague said, there's life after trauma, start engaging, uh, developing each other, and have assumed key leadership positions in political spaces and in social uh, spaces as well. And I usually say to my colleagues that I am also a living example of that. Having started a trough of life as a community facilitator and went up the ranks, field officer, regional coordinator, and I'm the manager currently. And say, so you can develop, you can uh, grow, even if you, you have experienced trauma. And participate and participate in the design and delivery of the services, design, deliver, planning, uh, delivery, and to follow ups. And uh, you, you, I felt like I have done what I could for my colleagues, and uh, also my colleagues, like my colleague was saying, the community facilitators. They are doing all that work and also gives me satisfaction and helps me in my healing journey. Was it's a process, it's not an event. I am also on my healing journey and they are also in their healing journeys and that work that they do in their communities, giving them satisfaction also helps them to heal and also heal others. And uh, recruiting the community facilitators have helped us as true of life to have a, a wider network of volunteers. And these volunteers, uh, they meet uh, periodically to support each other, to help each other with ideas and uh, give self-care. And uh, as an organization as well, we capacitate them on how they can uh, take care of themselves and support others. And I think as a, a organization that, that works with the survivors in our structures, in, in the organization tires, uh, we find we have uh, survivors like uh, Donald was saying, and it helps the organization to be cognizant of the needs of the survivors all the time and also support the process all the time. And there is buy-in from top management to the last person uh, to support this process and implement it uh, being informed with the issues of re-traumatization. So we really, really take seriously the trauma-informed care principles so that our work is done in a safe space. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Donal and Mike, for your excellent presentation. You, you've mentioned uh, an idea that I think we would all agree with, which is that you're a, a living example. And it's not easy to come into these forums and speak of one's experience. So we really, really appreciate it. And uh, to the audience, I would uh, briefly say we've seen so far two different examples of survivor engagement. In TAS, they do survivor engagement in the area of human rights advocacy, and we've just seen Tree of Life example in the area of health, where survivors support other survivors, and governance, as they have a, an advisory group of people who survive torture. And now I'm going to pass the floor to Asaf Israel. We've got Miriam Mayer with us. So Miriam, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Miriam. I'm a social worker. Uh, I used to be a social worker in the project, which is um, supported by IRCT and working with the torture survivors. Uh, and now I'm the uh, manager of the psychosocial department, um, but still can relate to the work uh, in the field. Um, and I'm speaking to you, um, well, first of all, I want to give you a sentence just of background that you know um, about whom are we talking when we in SAF talk about um, the survivors of torture, we're talking about asylum seekers uh, from Eritrea, uh, mostly a few also from Sudan. 
Um, the, and people who have entered Israel around 10 years ago have uh, been going through the so-called torture camps. Those were uh, camps in Sinai where traffickers were making lots of money while torturing people um, while they had to call their families at home in order to ask for ransom. And then they came to Israel. Now in Israel, people can apply for asylum, um, but the request is not worked on. So people are with um, pending asylum requests since 10 years or more. And um, I'm telling you this information because um, the group we're meeting in our work in the uh, group for victims or survivors of torture is um, he challenged on so many levels, okay? It's not only the experience, which would already be enough by itself, but it is also that in the uh, current frame uh, in, of Israel and how Israel decided to treat or not to treat people, um, they are missing services. Now, when you look at other people of the Israeli society, you can see that they do receive the services, they exist, okay? They are not like, not that everyone would miss them. No, they exist, but um, asylum seekers cannot have access to them. Uh, I'm talking here about um, uh, the services in the mental health area. There is one clinic in the whole country which is offering uh, services uh, to asylum seekers with um, cultural interpretation. Um, and beyond that, there is uh, not such a thing which would be designed specifically for the needs um, of torture survivors. In SF, we accompany people um, also via psychosocial support. Uh, that could be case management, that could also be um, group work and the specific project, um, which is also a little bit um, coming closer to what Mike was talking about, which was very impressive. Thank you for that. Um, is that a group um, called um, Experts from Experience. So it is for people who have already gone through um, their own journey, who understand um, that the pain they had to go through and the experiences is also something um, they can work with and the, uh, the knowledge they gain, they can um, uh, contribute to their peer, uh, peer people. Um, uh, and this is basically the only measurement there is in Israel for uh, torture survivors as uh, the legal existing services are not applying. And I have a lot of respect from the people joining this group and uh, being uh, brave to look not only at their own um, histories, but also to speak up and uh, try and to provide um, a helping help for others in the community. Because again, we're talking about people who are still facing a legal limbo. They're still not having any um, official status in Israel. Okay, they cannot be deported, right? But there is also not a, a real like um, asylum, a, like a granted asylum. And on top of that, the experiences from the past and the ongoing stress and yet there are people who are able to participate in the, the group experts from experience and who are able to uh, reflect on that and to give it further. And um, that is, uh, yeah, something which is, um, I find unbelievable again and again. Um, that's what I have to say. I kept it short. Um, Thank you, Miriam. Welcome if you have questions. Thank you. It's actually great that you've done that because we were slightly over time. So it, no, 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 not because of you, it's, it just happens. So I will thank you so much. And uh, people can make comments or questions in the Q&A session afterwards. And now we can give the floor to KRCT. And we have two people from KRCT with us today. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Miriam. Hello, everyone. And thanks for get the given opportunity. My name is Sabah Tepatoli Krasnice, and I represent the Kosovo Rehabilitation Center for Torture Victims, an NGO working with uh, and addressing the torture and trauma consequences uh, uh, of war-related uh, victims since uh, 99. 
as a manager of the of the rehabilitation unit and the program uh, supporting survivors of war it is my of course it is my pleasure to to share very briefly with you our experience and let's say our best practices or lessons learned in working with particular group of survivors uh, survivors of sexual violence during the war in Kosovo, which happened two more than two decades uh, ago. So as an organization, briefly, just to say that we work with uh, torture and trauma survivors since 1999. And uh, this uh, group was different, uh, but then in our perspective, uh, out of this 20 years of our work, uh, uh, we have, let's say, a common common opinion that working with survivors of sexual violence is one of the most challenging uh, for our context, let's say, I suppose, for the rest of the world because of the circumstances and because of the stigma related to this phenomenon, where in our case, survivors still continue to face many ch challenges and including gender inequalities and stigmatization, and of course, which limits their involvement in their social and economic life. But on the other hand, also it is our let's say, um, common uh, common uh, opinion in KRCT that uh, working with this group, we were able to see more closely, let's say, the sensitivity of human beings, as well as to feel, to tackle the positive results in the lives of many survivors. Indeed, uh, they are survivors themselves, although so far only few of them have had the courage to do so whose commitment has given force and who moved or given the motivation for, to this process in, in various forms and activity. And of course it was KRCT uh, staff and specialist psychosocial uh, uh, therapists who were there to support them in this uh, challenging, uh, challenging uh, path. As a non-governmental organization, how we have, let's say, how we support it and strengthen this commitment of survivors. First of all, uh, let's say a precondition for uh, for for all uh, further uh, further steps. It was provision of uh, support, psychosocial support, and uh, empowerment for survivors. It, this this was a starting point, and this uh, had. Uh, uh, different, uh, let's say, average or duration because it was uh, after the resources of the survivors and it was uh, up to resources that they had on place in family or community level and other factors as well. Uh, then the crucial thing that it, beside the psychosocial support is that to give them space uh, to talk openly. And when you say to talk openly is to by promoting, let's say, survivor-centered approach, it was uh, letting survivors simply uh, taking charge of their own narrative, simply telling their stories as they want to do it, either through uh, meeting with uh, therapists, either through meeting with uh, talking to therapists, to family members, to friends, or to other survivors, or documenting in a proper way their, their sufferings and their, their, uh, their stories. Uh, since early in the uh, early stages of our work, it was um, with survivors, it became evident that the survivor support group are very helpful, have been very helpful, and this is Beside the, the individual empowerment, this is the, the form that how we started to promote or to, to be more active in this uh, survivors engagement by creating first small uh, survivor groups in which group survivors needs to uh, could have uh, more space for talking uh, freely and more space to being uh, trusted and more space to being uh, understood. So uh, this was our first way how we promoted this uh, this uh, survivors uh, engagement through survivor supporting groups. And it was very helpful in, let's say, boosting the effectiveness of the psychosocial support that was provided for them. And of course, these support groups allowed the participants or empowered the participants to break out of their shells, to break out of their, their, their barriers they, they, they couldn't talk about. So some moved ahead. Hello, do you hear me? 
yeah. we can hear you yes yeah. okay i had the idea that i lost the connection sorry so of course this was and it is still pretty challenging for survivors in kosovo case because they have to deal not only with their individual uh, individual barriers and individual problems and consequences in their physical or mental health but also to face the social stigma and prejudices that prevail still in our community and especially in, in some areas more than in some others. Therefore, we carefully had to, and we still do to analyze, let's say the risk factors before we move forward or be, be, before we go ahead with survivor engagement. And in particular, when I'm talking this, is, I'm saying especially in uh, public testimonies because they have probably the biggest, uh, the biggest impact in making the situation, uh, let's say more, more positive than it is. Uh, confidentiality issues and family support uh, or lack of such support, it was also, it is crucial in our perspective and in our context, and it is starting point to move further. Without it, it's, it's impossible to go further or it's too risky, let's say, for a survivor to go ahead or for a survivor to encourage others to, to, do, to do the same. I will also like to emphasize the crucial importance of having a long-term plan in mentoring and supporting survivors' engagement. Even though it is important to engage her or his initiality, initially in different perspective, of course, we always have to think ahead with a great care how we can use her or his potential on the long run and build on build on it or scale up and maximize the 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 impact of course in kosovo there are several let's say several examples uh, several examples of actions or uh, of initiatives mainly run or led by by survivors themselves which had a huge impact uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, changing the laws in terms of uh, advocacy initiatives or in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, access for justice initiatives of course, because of time, I will not. I don't have uh, more more time to, to 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 say on it. But I will leave the floor to my colleague, psychologist Sevi, who will also follow up on the psychologist perspective on the barriers and the impact of Kosovo survivors in public engagement. I thank you for the attention, and of course, if there are some questions, we are here to to address them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Savahate. Looking forward to hearing more later in the Q&A session. And in the interest of time, I will ask your colleague to be succinct, if possible, as then we have a freedom from torture as well, and then the Q&A. So I give the floor to you now, and we're looking forward to hear more. Thank you, Carmen. Hi, everyone. My name is Sylvie Izeti. I'm a clinical psychologist working in KRCT since 2007, and I mainly work with survivors of sexual violence during the war. Uh, I'm glad that we are gathered together here to discuss a very sensitive and important subject, like it is survivors' barriers in public engagement. As we know, public engagement of survivors is a core component of fighting stigma and prevention of sexual violence. And we all participate in public engagement through our day-to-day -day activities by educating our society about our work, addressing stigma regarding sexual violence in war or in peace. But uh, regardless of the fact that we try to be the voice of survivors through different activities and campaigns, it is very, very different when survivors are empowered and uh, raise their own voice. I uh, want to remind you that in Kosovo for the first time in 2018, it was Vasilya Krasnici, a survivor of sexual violence during the war, that shared her traumatic experience in public and it was the first time that something like that happened in our country. So all this made a huge impact in our whole society. Her traumatic experience told by her touched everyone's heart and shake the foundation of every house here, I can say. And of course, 
stories of sexual violence had been heard before, but always from the survivors that covered their face and changed their voice to not discover their identity. And sure, those stories had special importance, but they do not manage to carry emotions like the story of Asfia, who spoke publicly through pain and tears that in one way awakened the conscience of society who used to blame them. Uh, in my clinical work, uh, I have noticed that survivors after the treatment or even during the treatment feel a special need for their voice to be heard and their stories to be told. Taking into account that stigma is still present in every society regarding sexual violence, and even more probably in Kosovo, which has a patriarchal mentality. As uh, my colleague Sebahada said, just few of the survivors took the courage to, to speak in public. Actually, only three of them out of 20,000 survivors as are supposed to be. But we all know that it's not necessary that survivors should be pushed to speak in public. Their voice can be heard in different ways, in big or small or in private ways. The most important thing is that they are safe, they are in safe space and they are, they are feeling respected actually. Uh, in our organization, after some session of indiv individual therapy, we invite the survivors and always with their permission to be part of the group therapy when in these groups they support and empower each other they speak together. So from here, their voice starts to be heard. Um, as I said, the survivors choose to raise their voice in different ways, and we have to provide different options for them to choose how they want to engage in writing, in audio, in video, or in person. What is very important is that the discussion and the content always have to be led by survivors, choosing how much detailed and how much they want to speak but without any, any feeling of pressure to, to participate. When we talk about challenges of uh, barriers in public engagement for survivors, I can say that we notice that when the, when the survivors deposit their evidence with the investigating police and the prosecutors. So in, in order to access justice, I mean, because you know that during the therapeutic treatment, the, survive, the survivors talk about the traumatic experiences in the extent they feel comfortable without any pressure. While during the deposition of the evidence in the prosecutor's uh, presence, survivors are pushed to talk more about more details, which sometimes make the trauma worse and they feel traumatized. Therefore, it is very necessary that survivors are always accompanied, accompanied by a psychologist or therapist during this process in order to be the, of, the, or to, to be the offer the right help and uh, take into account that the access to justice is a very vital step in helping survivors to, re, to repair and rebuild their lives. It is very important that people engaged in this process have to receive training on how to approach, approach best the survivors, ensuring that they are not traumatized all over again. What we all know, and I believe we all agree, is that survivors have a constant need for rehabilitation. So psychotherapy and having the survivors in the center, having the support from the family and all sectors of the communities will have will help actually survivors to heal, to empower and to engage. So just in this way, they can regain control over their lives and they can have a sense of normal life again. This I can say not for now, but I'm open for any question or discussion later, probably. Thank you so Thank much you for Phil. listening. Thank you so, so much. It's excellent to have your clinical perspective as well. And you've mentioned very important things. It's, it's not enough for us to provide support, but people who want to speak, they have to speak. If this is what they want to do, it's their space and, and it's their their time. And again, exactly. in the interest of time, I think we're, we're doing very well. And now I'll give the floor to our last uh, speaker for today from Freedom From Torture, the UK. So we have Kolbasia with us and then we can all gather in the Q&A. So Kolbasia, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, Carmen, just for, for, for sake of clarity, how, uh, how long time, you know, we have so I can 
I can well, adjust you. Yeah. So we would like five to. Five minutes. Okay, well, so uh, five uh, minutes from, from between, Lisa, so five minutes. five are, and ten, but then we have the Q&A <laughs> and the panelists can also expand during the, the Q&A. Mm. All right, I, I think I want to allow more time for the for the Q&A. So I, I will try to make it as short um, as possible. So I think first and foremost, I want to say thank you, you know, to all, to TAS, um, to Tree of Life, to Asaf and, and Care City, which, you know, they really highlighted how important the SOAVA, the SOAVA engagement, SOAVA participation is, and, you know, the different uh, modality that has been, uh, has been used. And also I wanna say thank you to the, um, you know, to the audience. I mean, you come in number, it's really, it's really good to see. And also I think there are a few people that I know, and I just wanna say hello to Charbonnel as well, that I will, spoken for a very long time. Charbonnet, I, I left you a private message there. You can have a you can have a look as well. So what 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 I'm um you know what what I'm gonna do, I think you know part, part of part of my my presentation is why do we engage torture survivors in the design and development development of a rehabilitation uh, you know services. And I think you know this part of um a bigger uh, webinar workshop that uh, Natasha and me, we are planning that we're gonna run in November um, as, um, you know, as, as, as a part of the effort that our city is putting kind of to bring this whoever participation, this whoever engagement at the center of, 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 of our umbrella and our, our network. So it's gonna be, we're gonna be going in more detail and the nitty gritty and understanding on those uh, two days webinar is I think just just look out for for Carmen email you know about that in the um in a few um, in the next few few weeks. So what what, what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna take a little bit part of the webinar that we're planning and then just um um highlight highlight something yeah and then true that I want you to think with me together yeah and also I think use um use use the comment use the chat below to, to answer. Yeah, I'm just gonna try to make it quick. So I'm, I'm just gonna share with you scenario and through that scenario, I'm gonna ask you a question and then respond as, as, as much as, as, as you can. All right, and then after that, when we have the, the bigger discussion, we're gonna discuss that. So here the scenario is as, as that. The scenario is just to allow you to understand when and who to ask a question in terms of um, in term of engagement, because engagement is really, is really important to understand exactly who's the best person to ask the question yeah so here is the scenario, the scenario is um um is a real experience that happened to me and 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 and, and few of my friends so i was in an immigration detention center here in london i i met i met few people that in the immigration and sometimes we just speak in the immigration detention center, we speak about eat about food about cake so and then after that I was released from the immigration detention center and the, my friend was still in the immigration detention. We, we lost contact. And after a after few years, I think we met, we bumped into each other in, this, in the street. I was, given a, I, was given a, I was given a refugee status. I, I went to university. I had, um, I had a job, I had an apartment. But my friend, his life gone completely contrary to, to, to mine. He hasn't got a status and he, he homeless. And then when we met, I invite him to come over, right? And it was really a reunion. I was really looking forward for that. And because I remember that we always spoke about eating cake and something like that, I decided that I'm gonna make, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bake a cake quickly. And I, I, I don't bake, I don't bake a cake. That's I think that's the first time and the last time I bake a cake, right? So, but I what I done, I just went went to a supermarket, I got a recipe from a book. And I bought the ingredient. Usually it's a lemon sponge cake, yeah. But because I like orange, I replaced lemon with orange. So I baked the cake. And and the weekend, my friend came, I gave him the cake, he ate the cake. I think, and then a few minutes later, while he's eating the cake, another friend came. And then when the came, friend came, and then he was like, Oh, yeah, guys, fine. What are you eating? And something like that. I said, Okay, we're eating like a orange, orange cake. Oh, that's fine. And then I asked the friend. Do you do you want the cake? Do you want to try the cake? And then the friend, the friend is called Fred. Yeah, he said Fred waited for a second and and say, oh, how the cake tastes like, right? 
So now I'm going to ask you a question. Just use the chat below, yeah? Just answer. So who do you think, I mean, one, one key element, yeah? I baked the cake. I did not eat the cake. I was doing a vegan vegan diet at that time, and the cake has an egg, so I could not eat the cake. So how how do you, who do you know is the best person to answer the question on how the cake tastes like? Just use the chat below that. Just write, you know, write, write your answer. There's no right, there's no wrong answer, right? Just write your answer. Who's the best person to answer the question, how the cake tastes like? And if you can, add us a why you think that this, this is the best person to answer or answer this question here. Yeah. So that's that's um, that's one one question. I'm just gonna look at the chat quickly. If yes, you, so people feel start. free, all of you, to type. And the question is, who do you think knows best what the, the cake tastes like? The the one yeah. cooking it, Colbasia, who didn't eat it, only cooked it, or the friend who ate it? And you have a few answers there, Colbasia. Yeah, many answers, and then uh, perhaps from there we can wrap up and go into the Q&A if you deem it appropriate. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I, th I think there's, there's, there's a few people that um, say that uh, me, that I, I, I know the ingredient, I know how the cake tastes like. I think we can take that to the, um, to, to the Q&A. Yeah? I'm going to add another more question onto, onto that. If now the question was asked, who, I mean, if the question was how the cake made, how the cake was baked, who's the best person to answer this question again? So I think for, for the sake of the time, so we're gonna take that into the um into the QA so that we're gonna have an opportunity because it's really important and that's tied to the work that we do as a, mm -hmm. a, a, a as as a human rights organization, as a service provider, as a treatment center, is when we need to understand something from the thing that we're doing. Who is the best person to ask the question? And that comes down to the uh, survival engagement and participation too. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Colbasia, for this excellent and uh, dynamic uh, illustration that will definitely be food for thought. It will be interesting to see what people have to say. And so now we're officially entering the Q&A session. So you can uh, type your questions and comments onto the chat. and. Yep, we have some questions already, Berta. Are you, yep, so. Or jump on mic, they can also jump on mic. Okay, yes, yeah, so feel free to jump on the mic or raise your hand. Perhaps whilst we get some questions, we can we can see some of the answers that uh, have been given to, to Colbastia's um, illustration. So some, we have Sarah Aydin from PSC in Germany saying that you can only have an idea of how the cake should taste, but not how it actually tastes. And, and yeah. we can see William Odipo saying the one who bakes the, cakes, bakes the cake knows how it tastes. The baker knows the ingredients using, used for baking. Uh, Colbasia, I don't know if, if there is yeah. anything that you'd like to say about that, and then yeah, we yeah. can go thank to you. Susan, who's got yeah. the hand up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think I think what I'm gonna say, just 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 think about it at the same time as 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 um as somebody that providing treatment, providing service. Yeah. So you know we have we have the person that ate the cake, right? Is my friend. His name his name is John. John ate the cake. I who cooked the cake, I did not eat the cake. So. Um, how the cake, if the cake is, is there's too much sugar in it, I would not know it because I did not taste it. It's only John that ate the cake that, you know, know if there, there's too much sugar or less sugar or is it too much orange or no orange. So for this question, who's the best, who's the best person to say how the cake tastes like is the person that ate the cake. So if the question was, was asked about who's, how the cake was made. Therefore, I am I am the baker, I am the cook who made the cake that no understand what is the ingredient I put there, how many minutes I put in, in the oven, and all this, and I'll be in a better place to explain how the cake was baked. baked. But I am not able to answer the question how the cake tested because I did not test the cake. So come, 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 come to us as um as um as, as a service provider, as freedom from torture. Is that the process that we always go through in our head? 
if we want to look at if we want to look at the service that we provide, we always ask ask ourselves in the question of, okay, who's 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 the baker, who's who's the eater. So if we want to want to ask the question, how how the service is efficacious or not, and how the service is giving the impact that is meeting the need of the survivors, or not. We cannot answer. We cannot ask that question to the person that delivering the service, but we ask the question to the survivor directly, because the survivor is going to tell us if the service that we're providing, the support, the treatment we're providing, is meeting the need or not. But if we want to understand if the service is, is efficient, if it, everything is done, is it the action is taken, is it everything put in place for the service to be able, kind of, to deliver accordingly, to make it easier. To make it the process shorter or the stay shorter for the survivors and the impact is bigger therefore we need to ask the person that delivering the service for example you know the clinicians and you know, those people that doing the job for us for us to understand the you know the efficiency of the service so i use this example just to illustrate how we can use it in our daily daily work to understand when we want to ask questions so who exactly we need to ask that question? And if it's that the question need to be asked to the survivors, we go to the survivors. And that's what is really important. The survivor engagement is a crucial part of the work that we do. Because at the end of the day, what we do, and we want to do the best that we can do you know, for the survivors. And for us to do that, we need to understand what is that best look like for the survivor's perspective, for the survivor's standpoint of view. That's why those two together go hand to hand. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Colvasia, for this excellent example. We really believe in what you've just uh, said our survivor engagement, and that's the whole reason why we're all here today. And I can see some hands up and some questions in the chat. So we'll go to Susan Wietz, um, Wietz, sorry, hand up if you want to ask your question or make your comment, Susan. Thanks, Carmen. Hi, everyone. This is a question probably for task mostly um, relating to advocacy work. Um, I could, I think a lot of our organizations that do survive engagement are um, mostly doing healing or other work in safe spaces. Um, in Zimbabwe, we're not necessarily in a safe space to be able to do a lot of healing or advocacy work. And I'm just wondering for task and for people that have done advocacy work, but in another country in a safe place, have you ever had repercussions or um, any kind of retaliation or things on your family back home or because of your advocacy elsewhere? Um, hi, this is Andrea. I'm going to ask Jakob and Fukada, I think you're still there, if you can answer very quickly. Because of the advocacy that you did with TAS, meeting, um, speaking public and meeting with congressional aides, did you, was there any retaliation against your family because of the advocacy with TAS? And we're not talking about for other reasons, but because of your advocacy with TAS specifically. Jakob, can you answer for a few minutes and then Fakada? Oh, uh, so I, I haven't had such experience up to now. Okay, um, Fakada, you got to unmute, Fakada, unmute. <laughs> okay. okay, for me, uh, being a member of uh, advocacy uh, at uh, Task International helped me a lot because when I come to first time in America, I was very much depressed. And uh, I can say that I was totally depressed. And when I got to Task International, even uh, I could not uh, able to express my feeling uh, during the first time. But uh, thanks to Task International, especially the advocacy uh, department, I can able to express uh, from time to time I could uh, express my internal feeling uh, and uh, I get relief from my depression. Even uh, after that, I go to different congressional areas uh, and uh, I can express my uh, torture and uh, even what's going on in our country in Ethiopia. Uh, even uh, I can be uh, a voice for uh, task survivors in Task International. Therefore, uh, 
uh, I got a great uh, power to express uh, my uh, internal feeling. Uh, uh, Bukata, Bukata, I know that um, you had some, when you're talking about your, your experiences and your opinions, you got some negative feedback on social media because you were criticizing the Ethiopian government, but yeah. did anything happen because you were, when you were meeting with congressional aides with TASC, did anybody in Ethiopia criticize you specifically when you were visiting congressional offices for TASC? Yeah, yeah, most, uh, most of the time I face uh, this challenge, uh, especially when I go to uh, congressional office, uh, at different times, I express what's going on, uh, the torture and killings in Ethiopia, and I express my idea in congressional areas. I didn't understand uh, that. However, uh, however the, especially when uh, I go to my media, uh, YouTube, Facebook, and different areas, I get a great uh, warning to stop it. And still, uh, people are following me to to refrain from any uh, media actions or participating in uh, advocacy services. Okay, but I, I think sorry to interrupt. I think that the question is though, what Fakada is talking about is it's not because of his meetings with TAS, because the congressional meetings that we have are private meetings. Um, you know, they're just. The congressional aid and some survivors, they're not recorded. So nobody in Ethiopia is gonna know about those meetings that he had, except the people who are participating. But he has got a lot of negative feedback because of his criticism of the Ethiopian government on social media. And I'll just add myself, we have not had anything that I can remember at all, simply because as I said, these meetings are all private meetings, whether they're in person and what we do, when we had in-person meetings, um, sometimes survivors would, some people would wanna choose to have a photo of themselves taken with the congressional aid. And sometimes they'd want that Facebook post only for themselves. And other times some people would wanna publicize it and make it public. But just for you to be aware, during this session, I took some photos of both Fakada and Yaakov participating in this event. And they are gonna use that for their asylum application. So they're going to use this IRCT event as a way to show how they are public advocates for TASC to help them to uh, when they are applying for asylum. So this is very useful. When I shut off my camera, that's what I was doing, was taking pictures of them. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea and uh, Fakari and Yako for, okay. for earlier on. We've got more questions and more hands up. We've got a question in the chat from Aisley from Spirasi, Ireland, asking whether there is research carried out by organizations regarding the impact of speaking out in terms of advocacy and awareness raising, and secondly, in carrying our peer support work for the survivors involved. And if so, where can we access this research and, and publication? We have some answers in the chat about that from Claudette and also from my colleague, Berta. There is a call for papers out for survivor engagement in our torture journal. The deadline is in December. So we strongly encourage you to submit a paper if you have experiences that you think could be of interest. And if you have any questions about that, my colleague Berta will write the, her email on the chat. She is our editor associate and, and, and she can help you with that. And we have various hands up from Colbastia, Natasha and Charbonnel. And I believe that's the order. So Colbastia, if you, if you want to go. I think I'll, I'll, I, will, I will allow Charbonnel to go, to go first and then, and then Natasha and then me. That's very kind, Colbastia. So since they have not spoken, I, I think that sounds yeah. good. So Charbonnel, would you like to go? I think you're muted. Right. Okay, thank you very much, Colbastia. I didn't see you for almost five or six years, four years. Yeah, is uh, for me, it's not, I want just to say that 
just a comment because before I want to make a presentation about what our organization HPNB is doing in Chad according of uh, uh, the political situation and the pressure, intimidation, threats that uh, our organization is facing because we are the only organization in Chad which is working the mental health issues and on the and the issue of tortures and as you know the Chadian government don't want doesn't want to to listen to people talking about tortures and our organization now is end up with a huge of refugees coming from Central Africa Republic from Darfur and also from the north of Nigeria Niger Cameroon flying their home because of the terrorist Boko Haram and all the majority of those uh, refugees are women and children who experience torture in their home. And also while flying to Chad, crossing the borders, they experience tortures. And coming in Chad, some of them receive uh, support from the international NGO, but that support finish on providing food, shelters, but the mental health issue is related a big challenge for them. HPNB with uh, limited resources couldn't provide integrally the medical uh, support to victims of tortures, but we are doing our best with the support from our partner IRCT to provide the psychosocial support to victims of torture. But we do the medical support with our capacity, uh, finance capacity that we have. In the, the survivor engagement, we notice that it is important for victims of tortures to, to know about the legal right to the rehabilitation. For that reason, we train some of the victims of tortures, let a paralegal survivor of torture that can advise another survivor of uh, torture to know about the right to rehabilitation and the right to reparation. It is not all the time uh, to come to AGPNV to ask if I, am, I have right to the repar reparation or I have right to the rehabilitation because if someone doesn't know his right, it is very difficult to help him to claim his right. And also we help victim of torture to speak out during the 26th of the June, the international UN day in support of the victim of torture, that we prefer let victim of torture to spoke out to the government, to the right, and then our organization come just to support. So I, want, I don't want to be very long because of the time. I do the summary, but I want also to share with our member, ILCT member, that because of our right to fight against torture and to promote the rehabilitation of victims of torture and to defend the survivor torture right, we receive a RAFTO prize for women rights that will be given on the 13th of November uh, in Norway. This is this prize is for all the IRCT members as a network because with the support of all the members, with the support of the IRCT, we got to this level. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Charbonnel, and thank you for, for announcing this award. It's something to really be proud of. Um, so we were very excited when we read about that. And thank you so much, because it's very important for all of us to understand what's happening in Chad as well, and to hear people from, from the front line. So thank you so much. And I can see we have various hands up, and we have also a question in the chat. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Bojan, from a GN Foundation. It's a question addressing KRCT. So if perhaps the KRCT colleagues could answer on the chat, that would be fantastic because we are about to wrap up and we have more hands up. So we had Colvastia and Natasha, and I can see also we have Mike's hand up, uh, Mike from a Tree of Life. So um, uh, Natasha, okay. do you want to go? Yes. Uh, thank you, Carmen. And first, first, first of all, congratulations, uh, Charbonnel. It was that's really um, great to hear uh, you sharing that experience. And it's really you really struck to the core that this is what we should be doing as members, organization, organization members within the IRCT umbrella. I just want to answer the question related to the risk associated to survivor engagement in. 
in activism. There is so many risks um, associated to the work that we do and repercussion to one's family at home is also one of them. This is why it's important as we thinking of embarking on this journey or already on this journey to always move or be directed by the principle of no, uh, do not cause any harm and also making sure that the safety of the person who is engaging is always paramount and the decision should always remain and re remain within the person engaging by weighting the benefit of the engagement and what could be the risk associated by that. For example, uh, a freedom from torture within the Survivor Speak Out Network, what we do is every time we have an engagement opportunity coming in, we make sure that firstly, it's safe for us to engage as a network and also as an individual for the person who want to, to commit, uh, happy to speak at the event. And also just literally, we think about if on a, in a long term, not just for the now as well, but in a long term, what could happen for me by uh, after me speaking at this event? Would they have an impact back home? Here where I am, because there are even sometimes we can feel we can say that we are in safe countries, but we never know the person that comes to the same organization with you, perhaps, or the person that you meet on the street. We don't know who they are. So it's always really important to think about the safety of the person who is being involved and also have the limits on how we share in, for example, in service, uh, with, within the SSO, we speak on behalf of the network rather than speaking on behalf of a personal account to as a way of minimizing the, uh, the risk to the person so that it becomes, it's less likely that you will be uh, traced based on the experience that you share. We also agree as a network that we do not share our experience, but we share, we, we dare really to advocate, to speak, to think about solutions on how we want to make things better rather than retro get, uh, looking back into sharing your personal experience, which again, maximizes the risk of being uh, identified. And Thank you. also just to add quickly, uh, Carmen, um, there was one response to Kobasha's uh, anecdote in terms of the cake when somebody said um, the cake will also taste different to uh, depending on uh, depending on the person who eats it. That is a really good point because as an organization that provides uh, services for torture rehabilitation, we should, we will all agree that we all have individual choices, individual tests. And that also goes with the services that we receive. The service that works for Kobasa might not work for me, or the service that works for X person might not work for B person. So as organizations providing rehabilitation, we should, be very flexible in the way that we are providing our services and avoid to be very rigid to say that this is the powerful the service and then it's this or not. So we should really think about this as well as we we are providing our services. Thank you so much, uh, Natasha. I can see we have uh, two more hands at the same time. Yeah, I'm uh, gonna be quick. It's time to wrap up, but what I will say, Colvasia, is that my yeah. my colleague Berta is going to share a poll with all of us. Um, so if you could kindly complete the poll to to see what your thoughts are about this webinar and you know what we can do again, uh, what we should change, and so on. And perhaps whilst people are uh, typing the poll that Berta is going to share, uh, uh, perhaps Colvasia and Mike uh, can wrap up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think for, for me, it just it just part of the uh, you know the question about because it's because it, it, it's happened to me twice and one um, 2015. I you know after ten years, I decided you know to visit uh, back home you know Chad. And I was really fruit and I was really intimidated and so on, so on, so So that's the last time that I, you know, I went, you know, I went there. So, you know, the risk is there, 
and the risk is i mean you know in my example it's, it happened to me and secondly it also happened to me but from a different country from a drc um you know then government because i was i was uh, we at freedom from Turkey, we launched a report on 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 torture and sexual violence in drc and i was the spokesperson and i was really attacked by the by then the the minister of communication and he was really attacking me all you know all over the all over the media and kind of try to rally other congolese kind of to 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 harm me all those kind of things so i think those things as natasha is saying part of those things that's risk that is, is is there part of the engagement but it's how how you mitigate the risk is really important thank you Thank you, Kulvashan. And I think it's super important, everyone's comments about the risks, because we want to be very realistic in the way we approach survivor engagement. And we want to be very mindful of the ethics and the do no harm principle. So these are really essential points. And I thank you all for, for bringing them up. And whilst it, you complete the poll, I will give the floor to Mike. Um, do you have any uh, wrapping up thoughts that you'd like to share or comments? Okay, thank you very much. I wanted to appreciate IRCT for supporting the partners in our survival led trauma healing training, which is currently underway in Zimbabwe. And also appreciate Chaponel, who is with us here in Zimbabwe. He's taking part in the training and maybe uh, you would say his experiences, and it was good to to hear him talking about the work that they do, and there's a lot of cross pollination and learning from this training. Thank you, Ayara City. Thank you, Chaponel. Maybe you wanna share your experience. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks all of you. So we can conclude with uh, these uh, nice words. Thank you so much. And uh, we would like to say as well that sometimes it's hard through the screen to convey how grateful we feel to all of you for sharing your stories and the high respect that we feel at the RCT for people working at the front line and for survivors that share their, their experiences. So really, we're really, really thankful and we're really honored that you're sharing your time with us and your experiences. And you can you can uh, read the chat for uh, people's last uh, comments. I can see Lisa's comments on digital security as well. Um, yes, so please take your time to to complete the poll, read the final thoughts, and I think it's time to conclude for today. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank you much. all, and Thank please you. remember to share words. Share the idea that we're working on this. If more want to join us, they can definitely join us. We would love to see even more participation in future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thanks, everyone. Well done. Bye. Uh, she, uh, she